Hi, hobby friends. Battle Brothers of the Beast of Badab arise. Your time has come. That's right, after a little stint in the jar of shame, I finally got our red Corsair friend here all painted up, and that means we are all done with army painting every major sub-faction of the Chaos Space Marines Codex. Cool. Of course, I'm never one to take a straight line, so as you can see here, we're kicking off this guy's improved paint job with a nice blue base coat. It's my beloved Molotow Petrol Blue. And when that's done, we double down on the blue with some Prussian Blue ink, kinda focused on those shadow areas, but honestly, a lot of this is going to be covered up, so I wouldn't really sweat it. With that in mind, let's start our gradual bleed round to red now by getting a little purple into the mix as well. This is really pretty randomly splidged and splodged about the place. What I'm trying to do here is just give myself a nicely varied base to work off of. He's not looking anything like a red Corsair just yet, but he is looking fairly varied. But actually, I'm not quite ready to move on to red just yet. One more shade on the blue side of the spectrum in the form of turquoise. This won't come through loads in the final product, but by applying it as a loose zenithal, it helps me keep track of my forms and creates something of a value bridge into the brighter reds that are to come. Okay, enough blue. Let's do bluish red now, aka purple. Although I'm still working pretty loosely, things do need to start taking shape here, so this purple paint, it's Molotow's Violet Dark, is getting focused on our mid-tone areas. It might seem a bit redundant, or at least not the best use of our time to add purple like this. We're going to go in with an actual red in just a second anyway, right? And red and blue mix to purple, right? So why not just rely on that mixing for our mid-tone? Well, that can work, but it's not what I'm looking for today. It's not the path we're on this time. More on that in a second. Right now, I want to finally, finally get some actual red red on this guy. It's good old Molotow Burgundy. We have to get really serious about our forms now though. This is a decidedly zenithal pass. And that's followed up with some deliciously bright traffic red to really finish up sculpting those forms. That's our armor work all done. I know it was a bit of a winding road this time, but hopefully that work has paid off. Put simply, what we're doing here is swapping out our usual value contrast between shadows and highlights with a hue contrast instead. Let's expand on that a bit while I get some white on this bare head and that skull. Most of the time, we think of shadows as dark and highlights as light, and obviously that is what's going on. More light in the highlights, less light in the shadows. That's why it's natural for us to reach for the black when we want to paint those shadows. But we have to remember, pigments aren't light. Speaking of black, I'm laying in the trim now using Vallejo Air Color Black. I don't own many hobby brand airbrush paints, but I do have this one, and the extra fluidity makes zipping around the trim a breeze. So yes, we may just want to mix black into our base color for shadows, but if 50% of what I talk about on this channel could be summarized, it would be a statement something like, make your shadows interesting. Black paint not only darkens colours, it also desaturates them. It makes the colours less vivid, and that can result in flat or slightly dead looking shadows. There are lots of ways to counter that, but this week we're just going off the scales, almost completely forgetting about the value and relying on the strong hue contrast between blue and red to give us our highlight shadow contrast. We're helped along here by the fact that blue is a cooler, generally heavier feeling tone that looks good in shadows, but I reckon you could also get some pretty cool effects with just about any contrasting pair of colours. Okay, that's the black trim base coats done, let's throw some paint onto the loincloth now. Nothing fancy here, just plain old brown, but I am making sure that when I get into the shadowy bits, I'm working with fairly transparent paint to allow those blue tones to come through a bit. 
Speaking of transparent, let's get back to talking about that purple stage in those initial base coats I was doing a second ago. As I mentioned, you could rely on the pigment mixing of blue and red to make your purple transition zone, but you might miss something if you do that. When you mix two pigments, one way of thinking about what's happening is that you're drawing a line between those two colors on the color wheel. What we're looking at here is the so-called real color wheel that is pretty good at representing what actual pigments do, but these things are always a compromise. Pigments and their interactions are complicated and you should always test things yourself. If we draw our line between red and blue, sure, we skirt purple, but really we're moving through that dark abyss at the center of the wheel. Fine if you want that value contrast, but not ideal if we're looking for full saturation punch. Drawing a line from blue into purple, then into red on the other hand, means we control where that saturation line goes, and we can keep things nice and punchy throughout the transition. Neither way is inherently better than the other, but if we know what we're doing, we're more likely to get the results we imagined. Okay, heady waffle over, let's get some metallics down now. Keeping up with the full saturation mentality though, I am not reaching for gunmetal or any plain old silver. We're picking up Amethyst Alchemy, a purpley metallic from Scale 75 that you saw me use last time on the Emperor's Children Chap. Like last time, the context of the colour here means it reads perfectly well as a silver. If I'd used this anywhere on, for example, the super low saturation Iron Warrior, a faction almost completely on the grayscale, then of course it would have stood out as a particularly pinky purple, but nestled here among the bright tones of our red Corsair, its really high value helps it read as pretty close to shiny white, i.e. bright silver. Copper up next, starting with Scale 75's Decayed Metal. I'll be straight with you, I could have been bolder here, maybe thrown some blue ink into a dark copper metallic instead, or glazed purples into my copper shadows, but having messed this guy up once before and already racking up some pretty risky options with all that crazy bright shadow stuff, I kept it simple on the metallic trim this time. Well, almost. I did go for the supremely rosy garnet alchemy for the mid-tone pass, proving the metallics really are very forgiving with blends and progressions. Back to good old pure copper for the highlights though. We're basically done now, just time to give my gratitude to patrons while I throw down some sketchy grey highlights on the black. My patrons, as well as being invariably charming, funny and capable of superhuman feats of strength, are also the folk funneling, yes financial, but also moral support into the channel, like a team of hirsute, perhaps slightly chaotic dwarves manning a spluttering engine of painterly war. It's because of you guys that I pick up a brush even on the dreariest day. Sincerely, thank you. Join those fine few by following the link below or just give the thumbs up a click and maybe post your favourite video of mine to some social media platform if you've ever gotten something out of the channel. More friends is more fun. All righty tighty frighty in the nighty, let's take a look-see at this pirate. Wham bam saturation ma'am, that is some glowy darkness there. When I got done with him, I realised that he kind of looks like a real-life Instagram filter, and I love it. In the grim darkness of the far future, your shadows can be any hue you like. Why not express a little colourful creativity on the tiny war folk every now and then? Alright, cheers as always for sticking around to the end, and I will catch you all next time.